Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, virtual primate conversation seminar series. For those of you who are here for the first time, this is an online seminar series run by the Primate Models for Behavior Evolution Lab at Oxford. The series has run for more than four years now, and it tends to have a focus on primates, but is really interdisciplinary, spanning anything from animal behavior to archaeology to human evolution and great ape conservation. If you want to know more about the seminar series, we posted the- Hello everyone, and welcome back to our uh, virtual primate sorry. conversation seminar series. For those of you- I'm sorry about that, uh, all sorted, I think. So um, I was saying that if you want to know more about the seminar series, we posted the love link and our Twitter details in the comments. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can revisit some of the memorable previous talks we've had. So for this time, we have been able to secure an amazing lineup of female speakers on various topics, including baboons, caputin monkeys, science writing for the public, and the conservation of gorillas. So today, we are very fortunate to have Julie Lesnick with us, who will explore the value and potential of insects as food and their importance over the course of human evolution. Julie is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Her research has been supported by the American Association of University Women and the Leakey Foundation. She was also a 2018-2019 Fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Science. She has a bachelor degrees from Northern Illinois University and a master's and PhD from the University of Michigan. Julie is an interdisciplinary scholar who combines paleoanthropology, primatology, human ecology, ethnology, and nutrition to examine the role of insects in the evolution of the human diet. Julie posits that insects were an important food source during human evolution, but that their consumption has been largely underestimated by researchers studying ancient human diets who tend to focus on meat eating, given the prevalence of this practice in the archaeological record. Julie has worked in many places, such as Southern, Eastern, and Western Africa, where she has been involved in multiple projects. And I will just mention a few. For example, by digging into termite mounds using bone tools that resemble those used by South African hominins, Julie was able to highlight the importance of termites in early human diets. By compiling data on termite ecology, great ape termite foraging behavior, and termites consumed by modern humans, Julie proposes macro termites termites to have been a desirable choice, prey choice for hominins. Julie also examines the role that women may have had in early human evolution simply by eating more insects than men. And Julie also explores cultural bias towards insect consumption in the West and why we don't eat bats. Her book, Edible Insects and Human Evolution, published in 2018 by the University Press of Florida has been featured by news outlets, including the National Public Radio and National Geographic. After reading this book, you will be convinced that insects were an important food during human evolution. Outside of academia, Julie is an advocate for insect consumption as a sustainable protein alternative. And she frequently engages with the public to talk about human evolution and food sustainability. She believes that if we accept that edible insects are part of the human legacy, we may, we may have new conversations about what is good to eat, both in past diets and for the future of food. It's clearly an apt topic given media coverage, including a recent article on the BBC, which calls insects a neglected protein rich superfood. So uh, now I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Julie on behalf of our lab and everyone watching. And as always, if anyone has any questions or comments, please add them to the live chat and hopefully we can address them at the end. Thank you so much, Julie, again. 
And without further delay, I will pass things over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to share some of the details of, of what you were explaining about my research, share some of those details of, of how I've reached those conclusions uh, with you today. So first to give you just an outline of what we're gonna cover today. First, I just wanna start with how I even got started with edible insects research. Um, it's a unique topic that not many people find themselves in. And so I wanna introduce myself that way. But then really I want to focus on how my research uh, creates models of insect consumption for the past and how I can and how I hope future um, research will continue to test these models. And then lastly, I wanna wrap up with the idea of insects as a potential food source as we think about um, more sustainable options going into the future. So to start back in 2001, the researchers, um, Lucinda Backwell and Francesco de Erico revisited these bone tools from South Africa. They had been found decades earlier and understood as digging implements, but it was the work of Backwell and de Erico that expanded the number of experiments that were done um, with their own bone tools to then microscopically match the wear patterns on their experimental tools with what we could see on the artifacts. So these artifacts, we have about a hundred of them across multiple sites in South Africa. We know that they are digging implements of some sort based on the wear and polish on the ends. And then when they did experiments, including uh, taking bark off of trees, digging into the ground for tubers, tanning hides, and digging into termite mounds, what they found was that the striations on the end of the artifacts look the most like digging into termite mounds. Basically what you have are narrow parallel striations that go into the termite mound in a singular direction. And because the termite mounds are made by termites, the soils are very finely sorted. So you're not getting the large rocks in there creating scars on the tools. And so this pretty uniform pattern was the uh, pattern seen the most frequently across these tools. And it started conversations about insects as food for hominins in a way that had never been done before. I, I still say it today that I think if you ask paleoanthropologists if they um, think that hominins were eating insects, they'd say, sure. But we rarely talk about it because there's so little direct evidence. And so that's what this research gave us in 2001. And that is where I started with. This is where I came in to do my PhD research. And so the question I had though was in this research, everybody was talking about eating termites, just a big group of termites. And what I realized was we were ignoring how diverse termites are. And if we want to understand them nutritionally and understand what they offered hominins, we really need to narrow this down because there are over 280 genera worldwide and 85 genera in sub-Saharan Africa alone. And then termites, we think of them as eating wood because we think of them as pests ruining our house, but they can eat you know, plant matter, but they can eat soil um, and they, they can eat a range of plant matter. So it's not just wood, they might eat grassy foods. So depending on what species of termites you have, they're gonna have a different diet and then that's gonna be you know, different nutritional value to the hominins eating them. And then additionally, the termites have a caste system. And so each different caste has their own metabolism, their own biology. And so they are going to store nutrients differently within themselves and again, provide a different nutritional food for these hominins in the past. So this was the question I wanted to address in my dissertation was, can I identify which genus of termites would be the best to use when talking about these past diet, these past diets? And so I narrowed it down, you know, as a place to start, I focused primarily on two genera. The first one are Trinervi termites. These are ones that are present across South Africa today. So if you're visiting these sites where these bone tools are, you are likely going to come across a termite mound of, of Trinervi termites termites. They were the ones that were central to the previous bone tool studies. Um, but one thing I realized was that they have a glue spitting defense. They have a low palatability. So even aardvarks who very much specialize on eating termites will only feed on them for a very short amount of time before their mouths are too irritated and they move on to find a different food source. So this, so I wanted to compare, you know, could this genus to another genus of termites. 
And so for the other one, I looked at macrotermies. And macrotermies, why I was interested in them is they're the most common genus of termites consumed by chimpanzees today. And instead of having that glue spitting kind of toxic defense, they use mandibular pinchers. They have a, a slashing defense with their mandibles. And chimpanzees take advantage of this defense by using their fishing probes into the mound. So then these termites, the soldiers specifically, are able, they attack that tool as a breach in the mound, and then they actually don't let go. It's a pretty unilateral mechanism. And then the chimps are able to fish them out of the mound. So not only is this a uh, more palatable defense mechanism, but it can be used um, to the chimpanzees and possibly to hominins advantage. So I repeated the use wear studies um, that were previously done. And what I did was I did experiments digging into these two different termite mounds. Now, they are actually quite different. The macrotermies termite mound kind of sketched on the left um, has a very tough outer shell, kind of cement-like at times, um, depending on how long it's baked in the sun. Um, and then the uh, Trinervi termes mound has a much thinner shell and it's a lot softer inner matrix. So the mound falls apart quicker um, when digging into it. And so my hope was that by digging into these two very different structures created by two different genera of termites that I'd be able to see um, differences on these bone tools and maybe be able to tell which type of termite mound they were being used on. The other thing I was trying to do was I used texture analysis. So this is the same um, techniques that we use on dental microware. And so this was, you know, really big at the time um, in the early 2000s. And I was actually one of the first people to do it on bone. So it works really well on hard dental enamel. And so I was hoping that with this incredibly um, user, uh, uh, it's a it's a technique that takes out a lot of user error um, because of the program that's used to run it. And so I thought that this might be able to see if there was a small difference between these two mounds and the wear patterns they left, this should be the technology that helps us find it. And instead, what I found is that maybe this technology shouldn't be used on bone. You can see in this image how rough everything is. And on microware, it's so, so clear and crisp. Um, and so I think there's just a lot of artifact going on from the bone. And basically what I found is that the signatures are not different between the termite mounts in my study. And so it's disappointing as a PhD student when you go out to set out to find something and you get inconclusive results. But inconclusive results are still worth reporting. Um, basically don't use texture analysis on bones. Uh, but it also is saying that maybe this isn't the right way to try to address this question. And so then where I went into from there is just this different approach of saying, maybe I should just model the past. Maybe if I take all of the information that we know about what hominins were eating in the past, I can make a hypothesis of which genus of termites makes the most sense for their diet. And so this is the kind of pivot that my research made during my dissertation, um, and which has set me up to, you know, continue working on this ever since. So Many apes, many populations of apes and humans eat termites, but they don't all show the same preference that we see in chimpanzees. So chimpanzees have an incredibly strong selection for the genus Macrotermes. They ignore other termites in their environment for the most part, but not everybody shares that preference. Mm -hmm. When we look at gorillas, gorillas eat a very different type of termite. They eat termites of the genus Cubitermes. Now these are soil feeding termites. And so that is different from both the Trinervi termites that tend to eat grasses and the um, Macrotermes that tend to eat more of the woody plant matter. What gorillas are getting from these Cubitermes are not just the termites themselves, but also the soil that they're contained, that's contained in the guts of those termites from what they were feeding on. And so they provide a very different nutritional resource. When we look at what humans are eating, what we see is that they also prefer macrotermies for the most part. Um, there are more species of macrotermies termites consumed by people around the world than any other um, genus. Uh, but in general, they're more variable. Depending on where people are in the world, there's going to be different termites available to them. But what we see is that, you know, we have this, you know, um, regular consumption of macrotermies. And a lot of times people will eat the soldiers year round, similar to how chimpanzees um, consume the macrotermy soldiers, but also during the 
reproductive period, the, the, it, it tends to be after at the beginning of rainy seasons, when the termite mounds, the allates fly, the flying termites emerge from the mounds. And these are young termites that are going to start new colonies. And so these are seasonally available and really exciting when they emerge. So when I'm thinking about what humans eat, yes, they eat the macrotermy soldiers, but they do also have the slight pref preference for these flying termites. And so when we look at these nutritionally, just to see what we have and the preferences of these three groups, if we look at what the chimps are eating, the soldiers of the macrotermies, you can see that they are termites that have incredibly large amounts of protein. So the soldier cast within any genus of termite tends to have more protein. And then macrotermies across termites tend to have the most protein. So when we compare that to cubitermies what the gorillas are focusing on, and they're generally selecting the workers, what we're seeing is just this large quantity of minerals that come from the soil, like iron. And then we compare that to the human preference of these flying termites, we can see that when you get those younger termites, whether they're the allates or the larvae that haven't fully developed into the other casts yet, we tend to see that they are higher in fat, which makes sense. The you know uh, juveniles need fat, store fat, so that they have the energy to grow. And so by eating allates, you take advantage of those fat stores, which fat is quite rare in the natural environment. So having these flying fat rich termites um, is an exciting time when they are available. And what was the most exciting about this to me when I realized this pattern was that the preferences reflect diet. When we think about what chimpanzees are eating, we know they're eating primarily fruit. And fruit, although is rich in micronutrients, is pretty low in protein. So chimpanzees have to supplement their diet with leaves or other sources of protein. So having those really protein-rich macrotermies termites is really useful in the chimpanzee diet. When then gorillas, who are folivores and primarily eat leaves, they're getting enough protein. They don't need those protein-rich macrotermies soldiers termites. But since they're eating less fruit, they're gonna have less micronutrients in their diet. So focusing on those soil feeding cubitermies termites is a great supplement to the gorilla diet. And so this gave me the ability to start modeling the past, realizing that insects like termites can really fit into diets like a nutritional supplement. And when I started thinking of it that way, that's how I made progress in in understanding what the hominids were eating in the past. Because basically I have three models available to me. I have sort of a chimp model, which is protein rich. I have a gorilla model, which is micronutrient rich. And then I have more of the modern human model, which is variable and takes advantage of a lot of the different termites, but there is a definite inclusion of fat rich termites in a way that's different than any of the other ape, apes eat termites. And so in thinking about the hominins from South Africa, the um, the species most associated with these bone tools are Australopithecus robustus. So we're thinking about the robust Australopithecine diet. You know, we have a few things that we can work with. We can work with isotope patterns and we can work with dental microware. That doesn't give us specific foods they were eating, just gives us general patterns. But within those general patterns, we can make the assumption that their dietary quality is not going to be lower than that of chimpanzees. And so we can kind of make a uh, minimal understanding of what was going on in the past in order to kind of come up with uh, a good idea of what supplement might have been useful to them. And so these are the termites I already showed you. And I added them to um, some more nutrients of common chimpanzee foods. So fruit and leaves, but also adding um, grasses or underground storage organs that are very commonly spoken about as uh, hominin resources that, that chimps may take advantage of, you know, um, in, in some instances. And so when we look at these nutritionally, again, it stands out that that protein in those macrotermy soldiers is a, is a type of protein that you don't normally find in chimpanzee foods. And then similarly, the fat that we see in the macrotermy's allates is more fat than we're gonna see in any of those other foods. So these two really stand out. Um, when we're looking at the cubitermy's workers, we're working with numbers that are more similar to other regularly consumed foods. And so when we're thinking about these robust Australopithecines, one thing that's really important to note in that 
we tend to forget sometimes when we're just thinking about australopithecines in general is that these robust australopithecines had rather large brains. Compared to earlier australopithecines, their brain size is about 20% larger. And that makes it similar to the brain size of early members of our genus. And so instead of thinking of it as, you know, uh, that, yeah, their, their diet wouldn't be any less quality than chimpanzees. It's important to start giving them credit that they're going to need to utilize resources beyond what we see chimpanzees do in order to support this large expensive organ. And specifically, fatty acids are crucial to brain function, um, to the brain's integrity and its ability to perform. So our brain runs on fat. And so hominins could have dug up larvae and allates in a manner similar, similar to how some human populations do this. And so in trying to determine which sort of termites we should be using in these models, I, I argue that we should really focus on macrotermies and especially giving credit to those flying uh, termites and the other fat rich larvae that become available and more easily obtained when you have a digging implement. So the flying termites, for instance, um, you know, when they're flying, you can knock them out of the sky with a, a branch, or if you had a net, you could catch them. But because they fly after the rains, they are just sitting in the mound with their wings waiting. And so if you get to the mound with your tool before that, you have access to all of them before they leave the mound. And so there's this fat rich resource that is just ripe for the taking for these hominins, if only they had a simple digging implement to be able to access them. And so then this then leads me to testing the model, right? That's a great story. Um, but one question I often get from people is, how did I even know that these macrotermies termites were available back then? And so to start, I, I tend to point people to this research of molecular phylogeny of macrotermies termites that shows that the speciation, that we, the species of macrotermies termites that we have today all speciated six to 23 million years ago. So the Pleistocene did not affect termite speciation in this, in this clade. So what this actually means is that these termites predate hominins on the landscape. And so in the right environments, these macrotermies termites would have been there. And so hominins in these environments would have had access to these termites. So it makes sense theoretically based on what we know from the molecular phylogeny. However, we still don't have the direct evidence that these termites were there until June of 2014. So excavations at Olduvai, so Olduvai in Tanzania um, at, at the site of PTK. So PTK is just down the gorge from the most famous site, FLK. Um, it is another hominin activity site. We have hominin bones and we have hominin tools. Um, and how, how sites are found at Old Divide, basically you have the famous site of FLK and it is on a layer that we call 22. And because it's a gorge, you can, we have these exposed walls, you can trace that level 22 throughout the whole gorge system. And so by finding exposures of level 22 is where researchers dig. And then that's how we're then able to actually find other hominin activity sites because we know they were walking around on that layer you know, about 2 million years ago. So PTK is one of those sites found in this way. And what they found in 2014 is this feature. And so what you can see here is that it is right on top of that Zinge layer. So where the hominins were walking, this feature is right on top of it. And that, and that on top of the feature is an ash tuff. So this feature was catastrophically preserved by the volcanic ash fall that preserved many of the fossils that we have from Olduvai. And so right in the area that we know hominins were being active, we have this feature. And so it was sent to me, an image of it was sent to me and I was asked if I thought this was a termite mound. And I, from a picture, you know, you, it looks like it. I can look at the internal structure of modern termite mounds and, and, and look at the structure that's amazingly preserved um, in, in this feature. And it, it seemed like a good, uh, a good hypothesis that this was termites. But we have to be careful, right? We have to actually figure out if these are termites. 
Um, we had to do a lot of research to try to understand um, if these were possibly invasive termites, right? Because termites build large underground channels to their nests. And so it's possible that they could have dug through and that we're seeing an, um, an inclusion, a modern inclusion in, at this fossil site. So we had to do a lot of chemistry to try to figure these things out. And first off, we don't see any of the tough in the termite mound. So there's no bioturbation. Um, so none of the ash is in there. And termites actually avoid ash. Um, so that is one way that we believe this is an actual ancient feature. But to tackle whether it's a termite mound, um, I work with a collaborator who had already been working on biomarkers at Olduvai, so Clay McGill. And basically what these biomarkers are showing is that um, there are different abundances and frequencies and distributions of these biological molecules in every organism. So depending on your metabolism, you store things differently in your body. And we're pretty patterned on this, like at least at a genus level. And so these create what we call fingerprints. And so the even beyond that, though, is that distribution of these molecules exist in geologic sediments. And so we can look in the past and get an idea about the organisms and what was what their biological processes were like in the past, what was living on that landscape and what was their biology like. And so uh, my colleague Clay had already done this for plant molecules at Olduvai to recreate um, uh, what the landscape was like um, when the hominids were walking around. And so now we decided to add an insect component to his research to see if we could identify the, the feature as not only termites, but could we even identify it to a genus level? And so that's where I came in. I was the one who went around and collected our comparative samples. I was in South Africa in the Northern province of Limpopo with women who collect termites regularly and bring them to market to sell. And they focus on two different species of macrotermies. Um, and I was also at Gambe, uh, where I visited termite mounds that were regularly visited um, by chimpanzees. So working with another collaborator on this project, Rob O'Malley. And so I was there to collect the termites so that we could look for those biomarker fingerprints of the termites themselves, um, of the termites that were consumed, as well as other ones that were in the area that were ignored as food. Um, for both humans and chimps, but also collecting the soil to see if the biomarkers reflect in the soil. And I felt like we had a good um, chance of this working because the termites going through their tunnels all the time through these termite mounds are constantly exfoliating their outer exoskeleton. Their cuticle is constantly sloughing off in these nests. So we should see molecules of termite in this soil. And so that was the... Um, the assumptions that we were making in the hopes that, that this would be successful in, in going about this research. So I don't have time to get into all of the chemistry, plus I am not the geochemist on the project, but what you see here are three rows and each row is the, is the fingerprint, the frequencies and distributions of these different molecules in each termite. So we have two species of macrotermies at the top and then an outgroup of cubitermies um, at the bottom. And if we, if we zoom into the area that is a specific where we're seeing the fingerprint, because you're getting a lot of noise, we're getting some of the plant matter and stuff as well in these samples. Um, but when we, when we zoom into the part that's the actual termite fingerprint, you can see in the top two that the peaks match, the two macrotermies peaks match, and that cubitermies is significantly different and does not match that pattern. So different species of macrotermies are indistinguishable in these hydrocarbon fingerprints um, that are, are preserved in the termites. So we can now see that we can tell a, a genus specific fingerprint for macrotermies. So then the next thing was, does it hold up in the soil? And so looking at an active termitarium compared to the modern termites, we see the exact same peaks. We see the exact same frequencies. And then incredibly exciting, when we look at the Olduvai termite mount, it has the same peaks. So we can not only confirm the Olduvai feature to be a termite mound, but it is a nest belonging to macrotermies termites. The type of termites that I've been saying hominins were most likely eating. And so where that leaves us is, I can't say for sure the hominins were eating these termites, right? It's still not direct evidence. But what we have is a macrotermies mound 
in a hominin activity site. And so hominins are there being active. And yes, they're they are um, butchering meat at the same time, but they are right by these termites. And so it could be coincidence, but from what we know of all of our, you know, our close living relatives, the great apes, and what we see people taking advantage of today, especially in tropical areas, this is an incredibly valuable food source. And so my way of thinking about it is that the reason this is an activity area is because it's a place to visit to get termites. Now that is, you know, my view on it and can't be supported directly with evidence. But I think if these hominins were as smart as we think they are, they would have been taking advantage of this resource, especially those fat rich termites when they were available. So that is what was going on for Australopithecines. Australopithecines, we use chimpanzees or other apes to model their behavior. Um, they're taking advantage most likely of social insects like termites and ants where, you know, it's easy to spot a, a termite mound on a landscape and the payoff from inside that mound is great. But when we get to Homo erectus, diet is different. Um, Homo erectus is much more similar to us. They're, they're about our height. Their brain size is approaching the modern human range. Um, and everything we know about their diet uh, and their activities is saying that they are much more variable than their earlier Australopithecine relatives. And so when we think of Homo erectus, not only do we think of them as covering a bigger uh, a geographic range, but all the evidence that we have from their diet, whether it's dental microware or stable isotopes shows that their diet was more var variable than earlier hominins. And so maybe that very variability includes expanding the breadth of insects that were consumed. And so when we think about insects that are consumed most frequently by people today, it's not termites. Yes, people do eat termites, but most common is palm weevils, which is on the right. And then very commonly also are grasshoppers. And so these are insects that with a little bit of ecological knowledge can be found in large numbers. Um, if you go out at the right time in the right place, um, you can be pretty certain that you can come home with some insects. And so with Homo erectus, the other thing we know about Homo erectus is that they have more complicated tools. They're making hand axes that require forethought. And so it is also likely that Homo erectus had something like a basket, something perishable that we'll never find in the archeological record for this many years ago. But it makes it possible then for them to gather resources and bring it home to the base camps that we also see in the archaeological record. So we know Homo erectus is not behaving the same as Australopithecines. And so when we're starting to think about what they were doing, we need to start looking at modern human foragers to create our models. Now, it's always really important to me to note that modern foragers are modern humans. They are not relics of the Stone Age. These are modern humans with full mental capacities. They just live in their environments differently than how, than how we do, right? We live in these concrete buildings. And so our food preferences can't tell us anything about Homo erectus. Um, and so it's important to, to remember that, you know, there is differences, like these are fully modern humans, but we can understand sort of the pattern of what it's like to be able to survive in these environments, to get the nutrients you need, to be able to reproduce. We can understand the basic patterns that we see in modern foragers and apply those to life in the past for Homo erectus. So there are correlates of foraging, whether we're talking Arctic foragers or tropical foragers, there are some things that are always the same. Group size is small, right? In order to not outstrip your resources, you have to maintain a small group size. But even then, these groups are mobile. You're going to eat what you have in one small location and have to move on to find new resources. So whether this is seasonally or constantly, we have mobility in these groups. Because the resources are um, less abundant, there's not really storage of resources and there's no accumulation of wealth in that way. And so these societies tend to be egalitarian, but we do see very different patterns of what men and women do, um, what their activities are like. And so this is the sexual division of labor. And so when we're thinking about the um, sexual division of labor, the, the, the pattern's pretty simple in that women tend to target re food resources with a low risk of acquisition failure. If they're gonna go out and do the work to find some food, they wanna come home with some food. Part of this is that they are conducting activity with their children often. So yes, uh, you know, you can have 
allo parenting and childcare, but that's not always available for every individual. So being able to take on tasks that don't put kids at risk tend to fall um, into the into what we see women doing. And then it's also important to remember that in naturally reproducing societies, women spend most of their prime either pregnant or, or nursing an infant. And so having a kid with them is going to be a something that's happening all the time. And so when we're thinking about women or what they're doing, we need to remember those kids. We're looking at what men are doing, they're going after the high risk resources. This might be large animals. We tend to think of women, of women gathering while men hunt. It's not that black and white, but the riskier animals, the large, larger ones that are you know, potentially more fatal in an accident are what men are going after. But they also might be going after honey of bees that sting and even hard to reach foods like mushrooms down the side of a cliff. Um, and so it, it's just that in general, the riskier resources tend to be targeted by men. When men are successful at, at hunting large animals, another correlate comes out in that this is more food than they can eat themselves. And so we see sharing at this time. Um, and so we tend to focus on meat and meat sharing when we're thinking about this division of labor, but that is only one small component of this pattern. And so there are two main, there are multiple hypotheses, but there are two main hypotheses as to why this pattern evolved. And so the first one is a cooperative provisioning model. This is suggesting that by targeting different resources, men and women are able to more efficiently exploit their environment, bring home different resources, share them with the family. You get a wider range of nutrients um, if you work together in that way. The other model, though, is a conflict model. The conflict model is saying that men and women have different conflicts with their environment, that they're going to have different nutritional needs because they have different reproductive needs. Um, and so in turn, they're going to target resources differently. So in thinking about this for Homo erectus, the cooperative provisioning model would have been a new model that you know evolved with this sort of base camp and the, the uh, cooperation that we think might have been going on because with large brains, in order to take care of kids, cooperation seems to be necessary. And so this seems to be a, a pattern that would have evolved with this idea of kind of a nuclear family. But the conflict model, if the conflict model is explaining it, this pattern could predate the human condition. This pattern may have been going on long before Homo erectus. And so I think it's important, one thing that I do in my research is that neither model is going to explain every single food resource. And so what I wanted to do was find what are the correlates of insect eating and see how the correlates of insect eating fit into these two models. So just testing the insect eating part of the model, because yes, when you're hunting large animals and you're sharing, that is very cooperative, but that's not every resource that's different in this sexual division of labor isn't meat sharing. And so I wanted to look at it specifically for insects to see which of these fit. So like I said, paleoanthropologists tend to be a little more obsessed with that meat eating, um, but is, is cooperative provisioning the best fit for understanding insects? And so first we can look at how insects are consumed in foraging societies today. So examples from across the continent. So the, the sun in Southern Africa, what we see here is that, that when women are foraging, if they come across an active termite mound, they will stop and eat them all day. And then they'll bring some more home. But it is a social thing, right? We need to not forget that eating isn't just a nutritional thing. It is a social activity as well. And so having a place to sit down and congregate and share info and time together, um, termites provide that for women in this society. Um, moving to uh, South America, to Paraguay, the Aceh. Women specifically target insects for an average of 15 minutes a day, meaning on their foraging, they have a, a, a protected amount of time that they use to just look for insects. And then in addition to that, if they encounter insects, they will take them when they are found. So that is to me showing this value that it requires that protected time in the day, they must be valued. Um, what we're seeing here is that most of that is insect larva, um, looking for um, palm weevil larva, like I had showed you earlier, is most commonly consumed here. And this quote for the Aranda in Australia um, illustrates one of my points as well. So women accompanied by their children 
carried digging sticks and go out in search of small fauna, including social insects that are available year round. So again, a simple digging implement and being in a safe and you know uh, activity that you can take your kids. We see this going on in Australia where they're going after insects such as termites, caterpillars, and ants. So in order to really, so we see that women are going after insects more than men. It is a resource that has low risk of acquisition failure. So in order to test those models, I just set up a, a very simple hypothesis testing, right? So if insects provide nutrients important to female reproduction, and then also if non-human primate females also consume insects more than their male counterparts, then the conflict model is the best fit for understanding this pattern. And so we can look at the nutritional needs of women versus men, thinking about that conflict with the environment. And one thing that really stands out is that when we tend to think about protein, we tend to think that men need more protein than women. Um, and men have, you know, body sizes that are, you know, 8% larger on average than women. So that's mo a lot of that is muscle mass. When you have increased muscle mass, you need more protein. And so we see that men need more protein than women. But remembering that in a naturally reproducing society, adult women spend most of their time either pregnant or lactating. When we're thinking about their conflicts with the environment, their protein needs go up beyond that of men. Um, we also these are also the other nutrients that increase for women, especially when they are when they are pregnant or lactating. So just needing more energy. So fat is going to be very helpful there. Needing micronutrients like iron, folic acid calcium and B12, things that we see in prenatal vitamins um, that are prescribed today. These are what's gonna be the difference in the women's conflict with their environment compared to men. And so when we're thinking about these diets, though, it is really important to always remember when we're talking about real paleo diets, what's going on in the past is that the only thing that's true of them is that they are highly variable. They are going to vary regionally and seasonally and daily, whether or not they're able to find something on that day. And so we're thinking about Homo erectus and their whole range. There is no singular diet to reconstruct for them. So it is important to remember that. But insects exist everywhere and there are thousands upon thousands of insect species. Um, and so when we look at them broadly, do they offer these nutrients? Could they have been used by females to um, meet those nutritional needs? And so these are you know, the most commonly consumed insects. The dashes actually mean there's no data um, you know, studying insects as food is a pretty new um, research area for most people um, in Western academia. And so there's a lot we still don't know. But what we can see is that these nutrients that are needed by women exist in, in insects across the board, wide ranges, right? So, you know, they might be targeting termite soldiers of macrotermies, you know, to get a lot of protein. But all insects are going to offer some amount of protein and they're all offering some amount of iron and fat um, and calcium as well. And so that another just case study to support this is that in the Amazon, um, uh, insects, uh, horticulturalists in, in the, in Amazonia, insects provided up to 12% of crude protein, um, for men and 26% of crude protein for women during one season of the year. Um, and so taking advantage of insects when they're seasonally available, we tend to have this narrative that seasonal foods are a fallback food. Like, oh, they only eat insects one season of the year. But instead I'm trying to change that narrative to like, oh, it's insect season, right? Like it's the time of year where you can get this very valuable resource, like those flying termites. Um, and so we do see that women are getting more of their protein um, than men from insects. And so that's that's part one of testing that hypothesis. Part two is the primate, primate side. What's going on with non-human primates? Well, we know that chimps are are um, very skilled tool users. It's the female chimps that are really going after the termites using those tools. And so in, in studying this, you know, it's understood as part of chimpanzee social system, right? The males are out there. They're, they're more concerned about their place in, in, in the social ranking. Um, so the young males are, are playing more and, and engaging in those sorts of be, in behaviors. While the female, uh, while the daughters of these females are sticking around a little more, hanging around mom and the termite mom more. So here um, is an image I took at Gombe where we have um, 
a adult female glitter nursing her daughter Gossamer while foraging for termites. And then after she was done nursing, Glitter got up and left that space for Gossamer to explore herself. And so she created her own tool. So we, we know this pattern of female chimps really well, um, but is it just chimps? Is it just tool-based um, is what was left for me to explore. We do see very similar patterns in orangutans who also use tools to forage for termites, um, but they do it arboreally. So the patterns are a little different because they have some increased risk of having their um, infants up there with them while they're stretching with a tool to access arboreal termites. But in general, we still see that it is the female orangutans more than the males that are going after insects. And then we can, so is this a tool using behavior, right? Is this only that female apes that use tools um, more, you know, is that, is that what we're seeing um, driving this pattern? But when we look at gorillas, so gorillas eat very different type of termites, right? They're eating those QB termies. And across studies, um, it, females do tend to eat the insects more than their male counterparts. Um, there are some, uh, some great studies where it's the, you know, the, silverback male really prefers termites and so he always chases everybody away um but in general we're looking uh you know uh, across populations females do tend to eat insects in, um, more than their male gorilla counterparts so insect eating in apes is much easier to study right they're going after social insects they might be using tools you know exactly what they're doing when they're doing it it's much harder to study for, for monkeys. And what I found is unless it is very specifically the subject of the research, right? That a researcher goes out to understand the amount of insects consumed and the difference between male and female consumption. If that is not the actual research question, this data doesn't exist. Um, but in these studies, I could find that where this was uh, a targeted part of the research design, I found in, in, in Circopithecoids, there is evidence for mangabe females eating insects more than their male counterparts. And for langurs, female langurs eating insects more than their male counterparts. And then in South America, it's very well documented for capuchins. And then we also see it for squirrel monkeys. So this pattern that females are going after insects more than males is a pattern beyond what we see in human foraging societies. And so therefore the conflict model is a much better explanation for this pattern in, in people today, but then also that it's very likely that we can apply this pattern to the past as well, since it's so widespread in the primate order. And actually when we think about primate evolution, Primates were originally insect eaters, right? With insect specialists. And so it was only about 50, 55 million years ago that we start seeing primates start diversifying their diets to include fruit in addition to these insects. And so this is why we see this throughout haplorines is that we know that, you know, it works with this ideal of male, male risk that it is a more conservative approach to continue to eat insects. And so the females are going to rely on the more conservative approach to diet. And that males might be the ones that were investigating fruit for the first time um, to see if it was a food resource. They were the ones who maybe pushed those boundaries in a way that females were more conservative about. And so we, we see this pattern just kind of evolve in parallel across the grade because it is the more conservative approach to uh, continue to rely more heavily on insects, and we see females doing that throughout the, throughout all of haplorines. So, just to wrap up, I do want to shift to us today a little bit. And so, looking at Neanderthals actually as a good transition to this. So, we know Australopithecines were focusing on social insects. Uh, Homo erectus likely diversified their insect consumption. So what were Neanderthals doing? Well, Neanderthals were living in the last glacial maximum, right? The, all of Europe was, was cold and, and covered in ice in most of its parts. Um, and so insects probably were not important to Neanderthals. And so when we're thinking about our diets, when we're thinking about Western diets, as much as I, I avoid using the word, um, it, it is useful for us today to think about Europe and the um, the countries and cultures that have been greatly influenced by European um, culture. And so when we think about it that way, insects are not in the deep history of Europeans. If, if Neanderthals and early hominid occupants of Europe 
where they needed to focus on meat, right? You have to eat the animal that can eat the dead grass or the bark um, during those snowy seasons of the year. And so when you're relying heavily on meat like that, then there's a redundancy in insects. And also insect diversity is just a lot less in these Northern latitudes that have these really cold seasons of the year. So in our history as Europeans, insects are not really a part of it in our ancestral diet. However, that does not explain why we have negative reactions to them, because there are plenty of people that have, don't have foods in their cultures, and they have zero opinion about that food. But we have an incredibly strong negative opinion about insects as food, when it's something that probably was never really important to us in the past. So that really is an important point that I want to bring up, is that what this comes down to is colonial exploration and the ethnocentrism of these explorers. If we think about Columbus traveling um, you know, to, to ex explore, what we see is people leaving Europe and crossing latitudes in a way that really had never been done before. So when they reach the Caribbean and see these people in, with their tropical diets, it is something unlike anything they'd ever thought humans would eat. And so I have this quote from one of the companions on Columbus's second voyage, speaking of people encountered um, in the Caribbean. They eat all the snakes and lizards and spiders and worms that they find upon the ground so that to my fancy, their bestiality is greater than that of any beast upon the face of the earth. And so this negative opinion, this othering this idea that if you are European and you're civilized, you don't eat insects. And if you are uncivilized, you are animal-like and you eat insects. And if you are animal-like, well, then that opens up the possibility to be able to treat you not like a human and enslave you to take care of sugar plantations, to commit genocide and to um, decimate the cultures. We see that in our history and we know it's there. And so this negative opinion about insects is tied up in that history and we shouldn't ignore it. And so when we're thinking about eating insects, you might be disgusted by it, right? You might have a lurching stomach and you might have a gag reflex. And you might be wondering how that can be cultural because it's so physiological. Well, disgust is one of the few emotions that's learned. And so it gets programmed in the developing brain of children. So if you think about it, two-year-olds will put anything in their mouth. And it, it, you know, up to the adults in the room to go, oh, no, that's disgusting. Don't put the trash in your mouth. Don't play in the toilet. And those strong disgust reactions are what program these pathways to teach that kid that that is disgusting and should be avoided. It is a useful uh, emotion in that way, in that it, it can protect you from getting disease salient, you know, uh, you know, foods like you want to avoid those. The problem is, is that you can train the brain to, to find non-harmful things disgusting. And so it's the disgust reaction that we've had since early exploration times that we carry with us today that perpetuates our understanding that insects are gross. And so when we're thinking about insects as food, I love this phrase of don't yuck my yum, right? If somebody wants to eat insects, let them eat insects. If somebody wants to eat anything you don't like, keep your opinion to yourself. You don't know their history and their culture and why they're choosing to eat those foods. And so especially if we're thinking about insects as a potential food for humans, we need to train younger generations to form their own opinion. We need to rein in our disgust response. I don't care if anybody, I show up to a lot of events, talk about edible insects, bring snacks. I don't care if you don't eat them. That doesn't bother me at all. It's deeply ingrained in me too. I've had to work really hard to overcome it. And I've only done that because I've built my career on it, right? So I don't mind if you don't want to overcome your psychological barriers. But the one thing I like asking people to do is just to rein in that disgust response because you never know who's watching and you want everybody to be able to make their own decisions about insects as food. Because just some final thoughts as we're thinking about foods for a sustainable future, there is a lot of potential of insects. When you think about the resources that go into our agriculture today, the amount of land that's used to farm cows and pigs, um, and the emissions of greenhouse gases that our agricultural animals emit, 
insects reduce that entire footprint. All animals scale down in efficiency. So pigs are more efficient than cows and chickens are more efficient than pigs. And insects give you all of the benefits of animal-based foods with such a smaller food footprint. And so if we're really thinking about a more sustainable future, insects are an incredibly appealing option. We just have to get over our history and our disgust and make this available to future generations. So thank you so much for having me and I am happy to take any questions. Start again. <laughs> The classic case. Hey? Thank you so much, Julie. That what a talk in terms of just the holistic approach from you know your your history and your journey and um, your the questions that you've approached and and the approaches you've taken. What's worked? What hasn't? I thought the it's just incredulous about the older eye feature and the work and the findings. Congratulations to you and all the workers on that. And say so also just really taking us through a journey and very much considering you know what we explore in terms of diet of excellent primates what we see it occurring in modern humans and of course historically in kind of recent human populations that perception of insectivity insect consumption as well so really i think a lot for us all to go away and think about so thank you for that and we've had a lot of questions so we're just going to try and work through as many of them as we can we may not be able to do all of them but um, we'll work through as many as we can so i'm just going to, to start now so we've got um thinking in terms of um chimpanzees and gorillas just in that conversation you you were saying about you know the differences maybe in consumption of termites and uh the implications that has for protein and fat i've got a question here of gorilla and chimpanzee consumption um, of different termite species are you aware of any sympatric populations um where both species and their insectivory has been studied at a single site. I mean, especially in context of you saying that, you know, this is something that needs to be focused on at sites. Um, have you come across any findings? Yeah, the, the, um, that research actually comes, that conclusion is really from Cameroon, from the site, the DJA, DJA, I'm sorry that I don't know how to pronounce the site. Um, the researchers, uh, they, were the, they were the ones that identified the different uh, termite and ant species that were being targeted and that chimps and gorillas are doing very different things. The, they were less, um, I, they, they mentioned that the, it matches diets, but they were less, um, d decisive in that conclusion. But to me, seeing their research on paper, um, to me, it fits that pattern so well and gave me the sort of foothold to be able to, to go on and use that in hominid diets. Um, but I think also in Gualugo, um, there that uh, it's being looked at there as well. I think as well, we, we need to come away from this as well. It, it was really interesting in, in the hypotheses testing and thinking about the conflict model and just how we're seeing that trend for female, higher rate of consumption in females and males. But just be going away to these sites to, you know, expand and really think about the various primates that are present within that site and, yeah, beyond the, the gray tapes and, and be thinking of that for, for many primates at the same site would be something we should all think about. Um, I've got as well uh, here, so, so in terms of thinking about um, tool use, I've got a question here. Um, in, in terms of the digging for potentially for attaining a various um, termites, uh, What's your thoughts in terms of it being dis more destructive than fishing? How might these strategies, you know, digging with tools, without tools, or with fish, you know, fishing for termites, affect maybe the longevity or sustainability of a termite colony? It, just thinking about uh, bioavailability of insects, I guess, for primates, but of course, for uh, various hominid ancestors. Uh, um, What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, in in visiting the women in Limpopo, uh, South Africa, they just it's it's like rotation, right? So they'll visit a mound and then they won't go back to it for a while. They let it rebound. So one of the things though is by targeting the soldiers. Um, so you, I didn't really put, uh, point it out, but what's really cool, I loved 
foraging with these women because what they would do is they would dig a hole right so you could do that with a digging stick like the hummus could and instead of dropping in a single probe they made a broom of probes so you increase the surface area um, of these termites so they're still targeting the soldiers and so when we're thinking about the longevity of the mound um as long as the queen is her chamber is still intact um she will more soldiers will keep being born and keep emerging. So there is probably a, a period of, um, you know, th there's probably a threshold where, um, you know, the termites, number one uh, predator are ants, actually. Um, and so maybe if you've taken the soldiers down too much, there might be an opportunity for ants to come in. But what I was seeing with these women is that they were sustainably doing it by just rotating which mound they visited when. Um, so it is an important thing to, to keep note of. Um, but, and that's another thing, like when I think about insects as the future of food, foragers are smart in how they forage for insects. Like they are, that is their food and they want to make sure it's there tomorrow. Um, and, and so when we're thinking about us eating insects, we should not be wild foraging, right? Like we, there is knowledge we don't have, we would not be taking care of the ecosystem in the same way. And so when I'm talking about the future of food, I am talking about farmed insects for human consumption. So many implications, as you say, thinking about to say sustainability and food production in the future for future generations. I mean, I think I, I read, I can't remember how many, uh, was it billion or million in terms of potential, you know, needs for insect consumption to say supply, you know, necessary protein for future generations. And um, it's it's an interesting conversation. And and you say taking that back in. Um, thinking in terms of sustainability, the knowledge needed and required to, to allow, if, if there was destruction to various termite mines that would require some time. It's interesting to think about, you know, we, we see a lot in terms of mental mapping mm -hmm. uh, concepts for, for primates in terms of ecological social selection pressures for yeah. um, intelligence. And here we have, you know, thinking about insects and food resources and their knowledge needed to in that respect of, of that sustainability or knowing when when they may be available and and to incorporate that into their um kind of mental mapping and you know their foraging as well it's really fascinating to think about really exciting um yeah. to think about yeah and it's a pretty it's a pattern that is sort of self-fulfilling right because if you go back to the termite mound tomorrow there's just not as many termites because you ate them the day before so it it just works naturally that the pattern is protective, but it's also because it's just not the payload that you would want for your efforts. It's yeah, I think as well. That, um, I mean, I, I'm not sure in terms of uh, availability. I guess of even if we say if we focus on macrotermies and the availability across a, a home range, and and you say moving around to con to incorporate this aspect into their diet. Uh, I say allowing recovery and, and where it's located to other food resources as well I think um, it's certainly I'm going away thinking wow I've really got to think of this hard it's it's fantastic it's really I think brought to attention to many of us today thank you um I've got um again some some questions uh, they just keep coming yeah so um in terms of uh, yeah one, one question so in relation to maybe um let's say someone's asked in terms of the South African bone tools uh, attributed to Pramptopus and Bustus, the termite consumption that you introduced us to at the beginning of your talk. Um, what, what's your thoughts in terms of accessing, it's actually the geophagy of the termite mounds rather than the termite consumption, or do you feel this could have been both or in terms of resource of termite mounds, uh, do you think it could have been both or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it very well could be. Um, I do, I find it, I'm trying to get paleoanthropologists when we're looking at dental microware, grit is something they talk about all the time. And I've yet to see somebody match grit and termites in when they talk about grit. And yes, like you eat food outside, you pick it up off the ground, there's gonna be grit, but there is a lot of grit when you're eating termites. Um, and so you get just sort of accidental geophagy in that way, but there are benefits of, you know, of the termite mound itself. Um, one of the things about macrotermies is that 
they are fungus farmers. Um, so inside their mound is a, a fungus that they have a symbiotic relationship with. So the macrotermies actually go forage for um, plant material, bring it back, and it's the fungus that digests it. And then the macrotermies feed on the, the, the digestive um, products of this fungus. So in this mound is not just soil, but the fungus as well. And so there's going to be different, you know, medicinal, nutritional benefits to the sort of whole ecosystem that is inside that mound. So there's possibilities for that. I stick with just the termites because that's hard enough to convince people. Um, but absolutely, I think there are additional benefits there as well. I think it's just wonderful that they can be building on from this. But as you say, just it, it just it was really clear in the talk, you know, to address some of these questions, the challenge in doing so. Um, it's, it was really made clear. So I think, yeah, I think, again, this is food for thought for others to be thinking about and incorporating with a conversation very much of um, the prevalence and uh, likely uh, inclusion of insectivory for past and present relatives. Okay, I'm just going to, the, the, as I say, uh, I've got uh, plenty more. Uh, so another one is, um, Are termites, um, so, so I, I think, um, actually, I'm going to just scroll up because there's an interesting question thinking about um, your, your thoughts. So, so you've conveyed in terms of thinking of, uh, you know, a nice uh, conveyance and think of the lipid content, the fat content of various uh, termites. And if we're thinking of termites, but uh, some phrase in terms of in insect consumption in human evolution, what, what your thoughts on or maybe how you relate it to various hypotheses like the expensive tissue and the energy, energy mm -hmm. trade-off hypotheses, what, what your thoughts are in an incorporation of uh, maybe these high protein or high yeah. lipid contents and the implications of that in thinking yeah. about those hypotheses. You know, I, I really try to focus, like when I make my main arguments, I really focus on these australopithecines, these later australopithecines, um, because they're, maybe they're scavenging, but their body size and their tool use is not suggestive of large quantities of meat. Um, and so I love that time period because it allows me to point at termites as being the most logical source of increased lipids in the diet. Um, when we're looking later, when we're looking at Homo erectus, they're hunting. We know they're great hunters, um, but we're not carnivores. And so I think it's really important to remember that we have a broader diet breath and that where this women aspect really comes in is that, yes, it might be the Homo erectus males that are doing a majority of the hunting, but if they don't come home with food, the women are probably out there getting their own food to take care of themselves. They're not just sitting there waiting um, to be fed. And so I think that's where the insect portion of the conversation comes in is like, yeah, it might not be the number one preferred source of protein or fat for later hominins, but during seasons where meat might've been um, less available, it would have been a crucial food to, yeah, it again, sort of that it does fit that fallback but I think we need to talk differently about the value of these foods as not a lesser option, but in, in, instead a important thing that gets you through. Absolutely. When, when I think about, you know, just how you conveyed and in your talk and thinking about so many components, such as the cultural, the discussed that element that is, is present in uh, particularly in, maybe in Western cultures today. But, um, you know, that flexibility, you, you, it was just wonderful thinking about that division of, of labour. As you say, we see this trend, as you laid out, uh, between men and women. But just, as you say, that flexibility of when maybe hunting or scavenging was not successful or, you know, what other resources available. And it's interesting to think of, you know, maybe there the you know, time that was deliberately, or, you know, this was, this was a resource that was sought out, you know, time was taken, as you say, as we see in various modern humans. So again, I think thinking, it was just lovely to see, as you say, you moving through the Australopithecus and into Homo erectus and into totally modern humans and just thinking about that, you know, bearing in mind that flexibility. Um, as you say, we can't reconstruct an exact diet, but 
taking various scenarios and where this would fit in. Um, it was, yeah, really nicely portrayed. And again, a take home message to think about that flexibility across, yeah, exactly. uh, across our clade and our evolution. Yeah, variability and flexibility in our diets is how we're here. You yeah. know, there isn't, you know, we can, we can celebrate meat and, you know, celebrate meat as being really important, um, as being high quality foods that fueled large brains. Um, you know, expensive tissue hypothesis is, a, is, is a wonderful way of thinking about these things. Um, but it, it's not everything, right? There are other nutrients that aren't available in meat, um, you know, that we still need. And sometimes those can be found in the insects. No, absolutely. Complete. Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, you're, you sold, yes, sold me, and I'm sure you sold, <laughs> many are sold. Um, so um, I'm just going to scroll down again. Um, I'm just, some new questions have been added, they just keep coming in. Um, yes, in terms of that, that distribution, so I'm not sure if it was mentioned, um, but, but just a question thinking about uh, macrotermes or other edible termites and, and maybe their distribution over Africa. Mm -hmm. um, of the only present in a specific ecological zones as well is a question just to try and kind of map out maybe in conversation about uh, the inclusiveness of, you know, or including insects into diet of modern humans. But I guess thinking about modeling and parallels in past environments uh, to try and get an idea of their distribution. Yeah. Um, you know, macrotermies, termites, different species kind of exist in different habitats. So um, the genus is kind of everywhere from what I know, at least sub-Saharan Africa, right? Um, and so the work I did, I did my dissertation, my digging uh, experiments at Fangoli in Senegal, because I wanted a more savanna-like environment, which is what we generally model for hominins. But then of course, these macrotermies are being eaten through all of the Central Africa uh, chimpanzee sites as well. So different species, but they are in dry habitats and, and um, uh, uh, more wet habitats. They do, there are preferences, termites do like areas with high water tables, which is sort of counterintuitive. You wouldn't think they'd want to dig down close to water, um, but it, 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 they're inside their mounds is actually very moist. Um, they're incredible architects. So in, to, in addition to farming fungus, they also build amazing architectural, um, these mounds are incredible for circulation of air and retaining moisture. Um, and so anyway, so that is one thing is that that high water table. So that can be found kind of everywhere. And so it's almost like more specific in an environment, you're more likely to find them in the high water table. Um, other termites are found um, in disturbed areas. So that is Trinervi termites. So that's why we see them all across South Africa because the current landscape is all disturbed by humans or um, through wildfire. Um, and so other termites can be found more specifically um, in that way. And so I, I don't know, I think macrotermies might colonize that way as well. So basically a fresh start, a lot of different termites will come in and make new homes. So in terms of, uh, it's interesting to think as you say, in terms of uh, modern environments, uh, habitat alteration and implications of is something maybe to, to, to take into account and, th and think about in, in terms of uh, distribution of termites, but uh, say how, how we consider that in the, in the parallels we make in paleo environments of, of ancestors. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting to, to think about uh, in terms of distribution and implications of the levels of disturbance. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, I just yeah. I, wow. There's just so many. <laughs> um, I've got here interesting in in the talk uh, at the end in thinking about um, uh, a version of insect eating, and um, so I think this is going to be the last question in in just aligning with the conclusion, conclusions of your talk. Could some of the aversion to insect eating, uh, could it stem um, this, from this risk aversion and progressive disconnection from nature? Well, i.e. because some insects can be harmful, you need to know how to select your insects. Do you think there's an element of that as well um, that's, that's occurring? 
Yeah, um, I, I usually talk about this in, in difference in latitudes, right? So where we are, um, you know, and we we have to create in order to survive in these northern latitudes. We have to create some sort of microhabitat. We have to whether it was a cave with a fire or you know um, or how we're heating our homes now. We need to seal our homes in order to to efficiently use our heat source. Um, and so we have a very different relationship with the outside environment. Like we want to keep it outside. So when we see a bug in our house, what we're seeing is a breach of our seal, right? We try, we tried to make an efficient seal of our home and you have breached that you are an intruder. Um, and so that is part of our relationship with insects as, as people that live, you know, in Northern latitudes, but in the tropics, you don't seal your home. You want it to be as open as possible for as much airflow as possible. And so you have no choice but to cohabitate with insects. And so you are gonna learn which ones are worth your time to try to get out of your house, right? There are harmful ones and you want them gone, but there's also ones that are gonna eat the harmful ones. So you want them to stay in. And then, so you just learn, like we have this category of bugs and we just shove everything in it. But when you live, in the tropics, especially, you have just a different relationship with insects and you learn the diversity, including which ones might be delicious, right? I think, yeah, I think, um, as you say, in terms of uh, deciphering those multiple factors in uh, cohabiting and living with an environment with, with insects, yes, certainly, I think, uh, yeah, I'm sure that there's an aspect in finding out which ones are tasty, um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no. You accidentally muted. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, Julie, thank you so much. Um, there are still so many questions that are on the list. I'm sorry that we couldn't go through all of them, but just thank you for such a wonderful overview. And I'm sure all of us who've uh, been watching and for those that will tune in to watch this at a later date will certainly come away with a lot to think about. And uh, I think those key messages on the absolute necessity to be exploring this uh, is it has you know it, it's very much there. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, yeah for your wonderful talk. Um, I'm just going to mention here that um, our next our next speaker is uh, um, Natalia Albuquerque, and that's going to be on the fourth of May uh, again at uh, UK time of four pm, and the title of Natalia's talk is going to be um, emotional and social regulation in capturing monkeys. So please join us for that uh, next Tuesday. <laughs>